Welcome back for Genesis chapter 39. So yesterday we saw the life of Judah, and there, in the beginning of the chapter, we learned that two of his sons, um, the Lord took their lives. Uh, the first one, it, all we know is that he was evil, and it doesn't really elaborate more than that. But the second son named Onan um, spilt his seed, if you recall that situation. And uh, I wanted to elaborate a little bit more. I didn't think I gave enough uh, detail on that. So I found this great article by Matt Slick at CARM. He's always got good stuff. And uh, I want to read it real quick. So Genesis chapter 38 verse 9 says, And Onan knew that the offspring would not be his um, because he had to marry his, um, his brother's uh, wife. So it came about that when he went into his brother's wife, he wasted his seed on the ground in order not to give offspring to his brother. So the question is, why did God uh, kill Onan for spilling the seed on the ground? The reason God did this is not that Onan wasted his seed on the ground, but that Onan refused to perform his familial duties of producing offspring for his brother. This was a great offense at the time. Now we must realize that the culture was very different from what ours is today. In that culture, when a man died and left no children, the next of kin was sometimes obligated to go into the wife to produce children. These children were then considered to be the descendants of the original late husband and would be raised as such. This way, the offspring would be able to take care of the mother, provide more people for the community, and thereby raise their own children, continuing the name of that family. Onan knew this and refused to take part in furthering the honor and name of the brother's wife and thereby also risking provision for her in the future. Uh, to this, God was very displeased and took Onan's life. Um, and again, the whole situation was a mess, um, but there was an obligation there that this guy was to fulfill, and that's the part that God wasn't happy with. So, all right, let's carry on. Now we're going to look at uh, Joseph and the situations he gets into. Okay, and one more note, and let's remember that God has his own ways of uh, grace and mercy and uh, discipline and judgment, and really that's up for him to decide and us to, to find out. Our, our job is to be obedient and to learn the scriptures. So, verse 1, now Joseph had been taken down to Egypt, and Potiphar, an Egyptian officer of Pharaoh, the captain of the bodyguard, bought him from the Ishmaelites, who had taken him down there. Uh, this pharaoh was likely Sesotris II, who reigned from 1897 to 1879 BC. Verse 2, the Lord was with Joseph, so he became a successful man, and he was in the house of his master, the Egyptian. Now his master saw that the Lord was with him, and how the Lord caused all that he did to prosper in his hand. So Joseph found favor in his sight, and became his personal servant, and he made him overseer of his house. And all that he owned, he put in his charge. Verse 5. It came about that from the time he had made him overseer in his house and over all that he owned, the Lord blessed the Egyptian's house on account of Joseph. Thus, the Lord's blessing was upon all that he owned, in the house and in the field. So he left everything he owned in Joseph's charge. And with him there, he did not concern himself with anything except the food which he ate. Now Joseph was handsome in form and in appearance. It came about after these events that his master's wife looked with desire at Joseph and said, Lie with me. Verse 8, But he refused and said to his master's wife, Behold, with me here, my master does not concern himself with anything in the house, and he has put all that he owns in my charge. There is no one greater in this house than I, and he has withheld nothing from me except you because you are his wife. How then could I do this great evil and sin against God? We see that Joseph had um, his heart and his head on straight. He rightly knew who the sin would actually be against. Verse 10, as she spoke to Joseph day after day, he did not listen to her to lie beside her or be with her. Good man, Joseph. Verse 11, now it happened one day that he went into the house to do his work and none of the men of the household was there inside. She caught him by his garment, saying, Lie with me. And he left his garment in her hand and fled and went outside. Verse 13. When she saw that he had left his garment in her hand and had fled outside, she called to the men of her household and said to them, 
See, he has brought in a Hebrew to us to make sport of us. He came in to me to lie with me, and I screamed. When he heard that I raised my voice and screamed, he left his garment beside me and fled and went outside. So she left his garment beside her until his master came home. Then she spoke to him with these words, The Hebrew slave whom you brought to us came in to me to make, me, to make sport of me. And as I raised my voice and screamed, he left his garment beside me and fled outside. Verse 19. Now when his master heard the words of his wife, which she spoke to him, saying, This is what your slave did to me, his anger burned. So Joseph's master took him and put him into the jail, the place where the king's prisoners were confined, and he was there in the jail. But the Lord was with Joseph and extended kindness to him and gave him favor in the sight of the chief jailer. The chief jailer committed to Joseph's charge all the prisoners who were in the jail, so that whatever was done there, he was responsible for it. The chief jailer did not supervise anything under Joseph's charge because the Lord was with him. And whatever he did, the Lord made to prosper. All right, uh, so that was a quick chapter. Please uh, check back in tomorrow for uh, chapter 40, and we'll continue seeing what happens with Joseph. God bless you.